In the pre-Columbian era, America was populated by Native Americans who came over the land bridge between modern-day Russia and Alaska around 30,000 years ago. When Christopher Columbus reached America in 1492, there were around 25 million natives living in the hundreds of separate hunter-gatherer or farm-based societies. Columbus mistakenly called them Indians, thinking he had reached India. Other explorers from Europe had reached America before, but Columbus arrived at a time when Europe had the resources to colonize it. Spain and their powerful armada sent conquistadors, who took advantage of the natives, exploiting them for economic gain, converting them to Catholicism, and killing millions by introducing smallpox. After defeating the Spanish armada in 1587, the English established their first colony in the New World, called Roanoke. When England returned three years later, there was no sign of the colony. England tried again in 1606 with the founding of Jamestown by a joint stock company called the Virginia Company. The people in the colony were all inexperienced and would have died were it not for the help of the Indians and the harsh laws imposed by Captain John Smith. In 1614, Pocahontas, the daughter of the chief of the Powhatan tribe, married John Rolfe of Roanoke, improving relations with the Indians. Indian relations declined rapidly, however, when the colony all but destroyed the Powhatans to gain more land to grow their new cash crop, tobacco. Tobacco was a huge success in Europe, and encouraged Roanoke to establish new settlements around Chesapeake Bay. As poverty, famine, and disease swept through Europe, many people traveled to the New World as indentured servants. Indentured servants received free passage to the New World in exchange for seven years of servitude. The House of Burgesses, established in Roanoke in 1619, allowed property-owning white males to vote, and was one of the first forms of government in the New World. Chesapeake attracted more than 130,000 migrants in the 17th century, 75% of which were indentured servants. As the Puritan, church-reforming movement of the 1620s arose in England, an extradited group of separatists set sail for the New World on the Mayflower, in search of religious freedom. They landed and set up colony in Plymouth, Massachusetts, and signed the Mayflower Compact, an early form of a constitution. With help from the Squanto Indians, they eventually grew into the Massachusetts Bay Colony, a haven for Puritan religious exiles led by John Winthrop. Despite enduring religious persecution, the colony was very intolerant toward other religious ideas. This was exemplified by Anne Hutchinson and Roger Williams, who were forced to move to Rhode Island after teaching controversial principles, such as separation of church and state. Colonies were also established in other places around the New World. Connecticut was established after the eradication of the Pequot Indians. Maryland was given to Lord Baltimore and declared a haven of religious tolerance. New York was colonized by the Dutch as a trading post and later captured by England. New Jersey became a community of Quakers, along with Pennsylvania, led by William Penn. Carolina was a proprietary colony, which was split into the North and South Carolinas and turned into a royal colony. As indentured servants became less convenient and Indians were difficult to enslave, blacks became a bigger and bigger source of labor as immigrants came from the Caribbean. This established the triangular trade between America, Europe, and Africa, and spread the farming of tobacco, rice, and indigo in the South. Before 1750, the British treated the colonies with salutary neglect, giving the colonies a sense of independence that later led to the Revolutionary War. England wanted all colony exports to be routed through England as a part of mercantilism, placing tariffs on competing products. These were supported through the Navigation Acts, forcing colonists to only buy goods from England. England set up harsh courts to enforce these Navigation Acts. Colonies at the time had individual governors and legislatures modeled after the British government. After many attempts, the New England Confederation was the first successful at creating a centralized government between the colonies, though it had little power. As the piety in the colonies weakened, the church instituted a halfway covenant, which allowed more people to join. The resulting impurity of the religion led to the Salem witch trials. Tales and rumors of witches led many suspected witches to be burned at the stake, hung, or drowned. It ended in 1693 when the governor's wife was accused of witchcraft. The governor's reasoning was backed by the emerging Enlightenment movement, spilling over from Europe. Enlightenment was an age of reason and philosophy, promoting free thought and new ideas. John Locke, Sir Isaac Newton, and Benjamin Franklin were popular revolutionary thinkers, teaching new philosophies and ideas. Many new colleges were formed in the colonies, though they were mostly used to teach ministers. The Enlightenment led to many important advancements in sciences and arts, and laid the groundwork for a new government. As new thinking influenced the colonists, people wanted a more easygoing church, which led to the Great Awakening. The Great Awakening consisted of preachers, who set up all over the New World to tell of the evils and consequences of sins in emotional and condescending speeches, encouraging more to join churches. As the rivalries of Europe made its way into the New World, Bacon's rebellion, led by Nathaniel Bacon, was to get England to protect farmers on the frontier against raids by Indians. The Stono Uprising was the first successful slave rebellion. After stealing guns from an armory, more than 100 slaves went on a rampage headed south. They were killed and captured before they could reach Spanish territory, but the uprising led to stricter laws governing blacks. The population of the colonies had grown five times its size in the period of 1700 to 1750. Most people lived near farms in rural areas, where work was separated by gender. Blacks worked on farms, mostly growing cash crops. Conditions in the cities were much worse than in the suburbs, with widespread poverty and disease. The French and Indian War, also known as the Seven Years' War, was a nine-year war starting in 1754 between the French and heroin Indians on one side and the British and Iroquois on the other. The war was an inevitable outcome of colonial expansion. The French wanted to keep the land in the area for fur trade, while the British needed it for farmland. After setting up fortified outposts around their land, George Washington led many failed attacks against the French. This led to a declaration of war by England. After the French surrendered to the might of the British army, England gained control of much of Canada. The war, which employed many colonial troops, led to the first widespread resentment of the English, both by the colonists and the Indians. 
This led to Pontiac's Rebellion, a series of attacks by a group of tribes against English settlements. In response to the rebellion, England instituted the Proclamation of 1763, which prevented settlements further west. This was regarded by the colonists as unwanted interference from England. The English were forced to eradicate the Indians using controversial tactics, such as smallpox-infected blankets. This, and the cost of the Seven Years' War, raised huge debt for England, whose cost-saving measures would eventually turn the colonists against them. When England's king decided that the colonies should help pay the debt, he instituted the Sugar Act of 1764, enforcing tax on molasses. This was followed by the Currency Act, outlawing paper money in the colonies. The final straw was the Stamp Act, which put a tax on all legal papers and documents. Writers and lawyers, who were most affected by this tax, began producing pamphlets with the motto, No Taxation Without Representation. Protesters of the tax formed mobs and groups, mainly the Sons of Liberty, who killed tax collectors and burned government buildings. When the law finally took effect, nobody was willing to try to collect the tax. The Townshend Acts received similar responses from the colonies. Only this time, soldiers were sent to enforce it. Colonies had to compete with these soldiers for jobs, and were generally annoyed by them. On March 5, 1770, a group of protesters were fired upon by the soldiers. Five were killed. This is known as the Boston Massacre. After new duties were put on tea sales from all but English tea, the Boston Tea Party happened. The English punished the colonies with a number of coercive and intolerable acts, closing Boston Harbor and tightening English control. The Quebec Acts then halted westward expansion and gave legal favor to Catholics. Finally fed up with England, delegates from all colonies except Georgia joined together at the First Continental Congress in 1774. They created a list of things they wanted the British to fix and started a boycott of all British goods. They set up boards of observation in the colonies to enforce these boycotts, which soon became the de facto governments in the colonies. The boards started collecting their own taxes and gathered weapons, arming themselves for a possible war. At this point, England had underestimated the growing revolutionary movement. They sent troops to confiscate weapons from an armory in Concord, hoping to avert violence. They were stopped by a group of Minutemen in Lexington, who were forced to retreat after a quick battle. When the troops reached Concord, hundreds more Minutemen awaited them, forcing the Redcoats to retreat. This is referred to as the shot heard round the world. The next year was quiet, while both sides rallied troops. Congress established a Continental Army at the Second Continental Congress, and George Washington was selected to lead it. The Olive Branch petition was also crafted to the Congress, hoping to avoid fighting, but England had no interest, as the boycotts were already hurting them enough. The colonists consisted of both Loyalists, who supported the Crown, and Patriots, who wanted independence. Support for independence grew immensely with the introduction of Thomas Paine's pamphlet, Common Sense. This led Thomas Jefferson to write the Declaration of Independence, addressing grievances and officially kicking off the Revolutionary War. The Battle of Saratoga was the first major battle in the war won by the colonists. This battle showed the rest of the world that Americans had a chance at winning, which rallied the French to their side who still carried resentment of the British from the French and Indian War. The British finally surrendered in October of 1781 after the battle at Yorktown. England signed the Treaty of Paris, officially making the colonies independent. The war led to increased tensions with the Indians, who fought for England during the war. It also led to a larger number of free blacks in the colonies. The war also led many women to petition for equal rights. Before the war was even over, Congress had signed the Articles of Confederation, the first national constitution. It came with the Northwest Ordinance, which outlawed slavery in some places, and was the precursor to the Bill of Rights. The Articles of Confederation severely limited the powers of the government, however, which had no way to pay for the war debt, as they could not impose taxes or tariffs. Shays' Rebellion further exposed these weaknesses. Anger toward the coastal elite led 1,500 farmers to go on a rampage for six months in protest of unfair policies. The Annapolis Convention was held to revise the Articles of Confederation, but only five people showed up. A larger convention was held in Philadelphia, where 55 delegates debated for days about the problems with the Articles of Confederation. The Virginia Plan, which called for an entirely new system, was blended with the New Jersey Plan, which recommended revisions in the Articles of Confederation in the Great Compromise. The result of this was the Constitution, setting up a three-section system of checks and balances that we still use today. The Constitution was widely protested as giving the government too much power until the Bill of Rights was added in 1791. George Washington was unanimously elected by the Electoral College to be the first president of the United States. Washington knew his actions would set the precedent for future presidents, so he was extremely careful about his actions. He created a cabinet full of advisors, including Alexander Hamilton and Thomas Jefferson, who would be the founders of the first two major political parties. Hamilton and John Adams favored a looser interpretation of the Constitution that gave the federal government more power. His followers became known as Federalists. Jefferson and James Madison feared a tyrannical government, thus favoring a strict interpretation of the Constitution. They were known as Democratic Republicans. Hamilton made some controversial changes during his time as treasurer. He proposed a national bank to help regulate and strengthen the economy. Naturally, it was opposed by the Democratic Republicans. Hamilton also assumed all of the state's national debt. In another revenue-generating measure, Hamilton imposed an excise tax on whiskey. This led to the Whiskey Rebellion, which was quickly put down by Washington and all men pardoned. Washington also managed many foreign affairs during his presidency. He declared neutrality during the French Revolution with the Neutrality Proclamation. He sent John Jay to England, who made Jay's Treaty, which evacuated the remaining British from the United States. He negotiated Pinckney's Treaty, removing the remaining Spanish from American soil. When Washington declined to run for a third term, John Adams was elected president. One of his greatest achievements was avoiding war with France. As the French started seizing American ships and sailors, he sent diplomats to negotiate a treaty, but the French demanded a huge bribe. This became known as the XYZ Affair. Response from the American public was hostile, but Adams was still able to negotiate a treaty. In an attempt to destroy the Democratic Republicans, Adams passed the Alien and Sedition Acts, which jailed writers for anti-government speech. 
Jefferson and the Democratic Republicans quickly drafted the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions, promoting nullification, the idea that states could declare federal laws unconstitutional. These laws split the Federalist Party in two, ensuring a Democratic-Republican victory as the next president. Thomas Jefferson and Aaron Burr received the same number of votes. The House of Representatives chose Jefferson in what is known as the Revolution of 1800. It was the first large-scale shift in the power of government that did not result in violence and rioting. Jefferson started his term by pardoning all who were convicted under the Alien and Sedition Acts, and filled many government positions with Democratic Republicans, positions which Adams had appointed Federalists to in his rage of losing power in the government. Jefferson, who ignored these midnight appointments, got the government sued in the case of Marbury v. Madison, which established the principle of judicial review, where the Supreme Court could challenge the constitutionality of congressional acts. Jefferson also completed the Louisiana Purchase, buying New Orleans from the French in order to ensure the ease of trade in the region. This effectively doubled the size of the United States. Jefferson sent Lewis and Clark on a mission to explore the land and investigate the possibility of expanding. During Jefferson's second term, the U.S. got caught up in the War of 1812. England and France began to capture and enlist American ships and sailors in an attempt to gain more troops for their war. Knowing America couldn't fight either at the time, Jefferson started a boycott with the Embargo Act while simultaneously building the Navy. This caused economic disaster in the North that was partially mended by the Non-Intercourse Act, reallowing most trade. As Jefferson's term ended, he endorsed James Madison, who won the presidency. England continued to attack American ships, however, and Madison was forced to declare war, under pressure from pro-war groups such as the War Hawks, led by John C. Calhoun and Henry Clay. The United States was able to fight off the English in most battles until British soldiers captured the capital in 1814 and set fire to the White House. The war ended abruptly when the Treaty of Ghent was established. Blockades of American shipping forced the North to establish factories to make their own products, spurring American manufacturing. Subjected to hatred due to their opposition of the war, the Federalist Party disintegrated, leaving only one political party in the United States. This period of unity is referred to as the Era of Good Feelings. This era was marked by expansion in all sectors, including the acquisition of Florida in 1819 with the adams onis Treaty, drafted by John Quincy Adams. The U.S. also told everyone about their Monroe Doctrine, which told everyone else not to mess with us. The era came to an abrupt end with the Panic of 1819, when the overspending of Americans finally caught up with them, leaving many foreclosed businesses and poverty-stricken people in its wake. This period also caused much debate over the future of slavery in the colonies. Admitting new states to the Union could upset the equal balance of free and slave states. The first state to experience this debate was Missouri. Henry Clay reached the Missouri Compromise, which admitted Missouri as a slave state, but split Maine off from Massachusetts and admitted them as a free state. The next president of the United States was John Quincy Adams, son of John Adams. He was accused of a corrupt bargain when he appointed Henry Clay as Secretary of State after Clay helped him win the presidency. Adams' Federalist views clashed with the Republican views of the rest of Congress, not allowing him to do much. During Adams' presidency, Andrew Jackson was rallying support for his campaign, which would later evolve into the Democratic Party. Their campaign against Adams in 1828 was a harsh one, with each candidate slandering the other. When Jackson won by a landslide, he appointed many of his supporters, which established the spoils system, or the trading of jobs for political favors. Jacksonian democracy envisioned a society controlled by human farmers. This vision made him the first president of the people, as it was also the first time that all white males could vote, not just landowners. During Jackson's presidency, gold was discovered on Cherokee land in Georgia. When the Georgians demanded a share of the gold, the Cherokees sued. The Supreme Court ruled in favor of the Cherokees, but Jackson didn't care, and he exiled the Cherokees anyway along what is known as the Trail of Tears. Jackson strongly involved himself in the economic landscape, demolishing the national bank and issuing hard currency as opposed to paper money. He tried not to get involved in many of the social reform movements happening at the time, however. He even enforced the gag rule, preventing Congress from even discussing the issue of slavery. A rival group of Jacksons, consisting of strong supporters of the reform movements, formed the Whig Party, which strongly encouraged government intervention in social issues. One of these social movements was the Second Great Awakening, which was just like the first one, only it put more emphasis on helping others than individual salvation. This led into the Temperance Movement, comprised mostly of women who wanted to abolish alcoholism, gambling, and many other sinful acts. This was related to the utopian movements at the time, establishing societies such as the Shakers, New Harmony, and Mormonism, which hoped to be perfect and free of sin. Penitentiary and asylum reform was also a large movement in the 1840s, led by Dorothea Dix, who wanted to improve conditions in prisons and asylums, as well as gear them more toward rehabilitation rather than isolation. Women also petitioned for the right to vote during the Seneca Falls Convention. The largest movement at the time, however, was the abolition movement. The Second Great Awakening gave the widespread belief that slavery was morally wrong. Many radical abolitionists printed books and pamphlets, such as Frederick Douglass's Memoirs and Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe. The abolition movement further separated the North and South, which had been becoming more and more separated and different. Eli Whitney's cotton gin made slavery in plantations a larger necessity in the South and replaced tobacco as the staple cash crop. Meanwhile, the North was developing a larger system of transportation, including railroads, canals, and telegraphs. American Manifest Destiny in the South led them to occupy and fight for their control of Texas in the Battle of the Alamo, which was a huge loss for the Texans and spurred the Mexican-American War with the slogan, Remember the Alamo. The war went so well that then-President James Polk ordered troops sent into California and Oregon, hoping to claim those as well. The war ended with the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, in which the U.S. paid $15 million for Texas, Arizona, New Mexico, California, Nevada, and Utah. The debate of slavery in these states was accompanied with the Wilmot Proviso, which outlawed slavery in all colonies, and popular sovereignty, which provided each individual state the right to vote for themselves whether they would be a free or a slave state. 
This issue divided the Whig Party into anti-slavery Whigs and the Free Soil Party, while the Democrats remained the go-to party for pro-slavery support. Stephen Douglas sought to fix these problems with the Kansas-Nebraska Act. This act also allowed the states to choose for themselves. Since this was undoubtedly pro-slavery, northern states passed laws to weaken the Fugitive Slave Act in response. This drove a spike between the North and South and led to the formation of the Republican Party, consisting of former anti-slavery parties. Another party, the Know Nothings, also appeared during this time. They had strong anti-foreigner views, hating especially on the Irish. The debate over slavery in the territories also led to widespread violence in Kansas, killing more than 200 people. This is known as Bleeding Kansas. John Brown's raid of Harper's Ferry also took place around this time, capturing an armory and hoping to start a slave revolt. Stephen Douglas sought to fix these problems with the Kansas-Nebraska Act. This act also allowed the states to choose for themselves. Since this was undoubtedly pro-slavery, northern states passed laws to weaken the Fugitive Slave Act in response. This drove a spike between the North and South and led to the formation of the Republican Party, consisting of former anti-slavery parties. Another party, the Know Nothings, also appeared during this time. They had strong anti-foreigner views, hating especially on the Irish. The debate over slavery in the territories also led to widespread violence in Kansas, killing more than 200 people. This is known as Bleeding Kansas. John Brown's raid of Harper's Ferry also took place around this time, capturing an army and hoping to start a slave revolt. The fighting spread to the White House when Congressman Andrew Butler beat abolitionist Charles Sumner with a cane. Tensions further escalated with the case of Dred Scott, who sued for his freedom when his owner temporarily brought him into the North. Scott lost the case when the Supreme Court ruled that blacks could never be citizens and as such could not sue. All of these pro-South decisions fueled a suspicion called slave power, the fear that the government could be controlled by a small group of rich Southerners. These fears led into the Lincoln-Douglas debates, a series of heated debates between Abraham Lincoln and Stephen Douglas, in which Lincoln won and gained a seat in the Senate. Lincoln continued on to win the presidency in 1860 against the regionally split Democratic Party. Three months before he was inaugurated, however, the Southern states decided to split off from the Union and form the Confederate States of America, while a few border states stayed. The war was not entirely about slavery, with Lincoln mentioning that he would end the war without abolishing slavery if he could, being careful not to scare the border states away. Jefferson Davis quickly took control in the South, reorganizing their infrastructure to prepare for war and make up what they had lost in seceding. This expansion caused massive inflation, putting many people in poverty. He also imposed a military draft. In the North, the war led to massive economic growth and development, as Lincoln also introduced national currency. In 1682 and 4, Lincoln came up with the Emancipation Proclamation and the 13th Amendment, freeing all slaves in the South. Though no Southerners would comply with this, it allowed the army to free slaves as they traversed the South. Lincoln defeated his former rival George McClellan in the election of 1864. The war took a turn in favor of the North with a series of victories and Sherman's March, which destroyed everything in its path and devastated the South. The Confederacy was forced to surrender in April of 1865, and Lincoln was assassinated five days later by John Wilkes Booth. The twelve years following the Civil War became known as Reconstruction. When Lincoln said, with malice toward none and charity for all, he showed that he did not want to punish the South, but to compromise with them and to make them as happy as possible. Lincoln founded the 10% Plan, which required 10% of voters in the South to swear an oath of allegiance. When Congress decided that this was too lenient, they proposed the Wade Davis Bill, which required 50% of Southerners to swear an oath and be ruled by a military governor. Lincoln vetoed the bill, and neither of them passed. Once Lincoln was assassinated, though, Vice President Andrew Johnson assumed the presidency. Johnson was able to pass his more stringent Reconstruction Plan, which took political power from the current elite and forced state governments to create new constitutions outlawing slavery. Slavery was officially outlawed, but most blacks were still forced to become sharecroppers, despite the efforts of the Freedmen's Bureau. Sharecroppers would give a percentage of their crop yield in exchange for land, but that and the institution of black codes, laws governing the now freed blacks, essentially gave former slaves no more rights than they had before they were freed. When Johnson vetoed Congress's plan to rework the Reconstruction Bill and declared Reconstruction over, Congress passed the 14th Amendment, which declared everyone to be equal, essentially outlawing black codes. The Compromise of 1877 pulled all troops out of the South, however, so there was little enforcement of the laws. Following Reconstruction, the period between 1877 and 1900 became known as the Machine Age. This era was characterized by new inventions in manufacturing and industry, including electricity and the light bulb. These speedy manufacturing machines meant goods could be produced for cheaper if they were made in larger quantities. This led to corporations and monopolies, formed by both horizontal and vertical integration. Horizontal integration is when one company buys up all of its competing companies, while vertical integration is where a company controls every aspect of production. An example would be Standard Oil buying out petroleum miners, refineries, and gas stations. This booming corporation market led to giant loans and therefore occasional bank failures, leading to the Sherman Antitrust Act, which tried to ensure a competitive marketplace. Extremely rich industry leaders became increasingly hated by the public and caused widespread corruption. They weren't all bad, however. Andrew Carnegie, who became the richest man in the world off of the steel industry, created his theory of social Darwinism, allowing only the best or fittest corporations to survive. He also created the Gospel of Wealth, which basically proposed that a rich man should give all of his money away. With decreasing wages due to assembly line production and greedy companies, more and more people were drawn to political bosses. Long workdays and dangerous conditions were still becoming the norm, however. This led to the formation of unions, the most popular of which was called the Knights of Labor. Unions wanted an eight-hour workday, decent pay, child labor laws, and safety regulations. The unions were increasingly seen as violent, however, and with the police killing bombs set off during the Haymarket Square riot and the sensational exaggeration of the rising yellow journalism, public hatred was at an all-time high. Samuel Gompers recognized that the public could be the strongest ally to a union and created the American Federation of Labor, a moderate group who recruited masses of both skilled and unskilled workers who made many successful reforms in the labor industry. 
Meanwhile, in the South, the majority of the population were still farmers, while the sharecropping system kept poor blacks and whites in virtual slavery. This time also saw the introduction of Jim Crow laws, which became the start of segregation. The subsequent court case of Plessy v. Ferguson decided segregation was constitutional, as long as facilities were separate but equal. On the western side of the U.S., ranching and mining were emerging as the largest industries, brought about by the establishment of railroads. Early railroads were very problematic, however. Railroad companies, even though funded by taxes, refused to fall under government regulation and used shady tactics to make money and undermine their competitors, such as overcharging in rural areas where they had a monopoly and undercharging in busy areas in order to beat the competition. The railroad industry also considered Buffalo to be a nuisance, and as such, railroad companies paid others to kill as many as possible, nearly rendering them extinct. As one of the most valuable resources for Indians, however, the extinction of Buffalo led to many Sioux attacks. The federal government responded by sending troops into the region, who eventually defeated the Indians. The discrimination against the Indians in general led them to be placed on reservations, though the inferiority of the land and the grouping of enemy tribes quickly disintegrated the system. The subsequent Dawes Severalty Act allotted land and citizenship to Indians, though their refusal to accept eventually left most homeless and essentially wiped them out altogether. Railroads did bring great good to the country, however. Faster transportation meant information, technology, supplies, and people could connect the country. Railroads further helped create a standard time zone system and turned small depot towns into bustling cities. This increased population also led to the formation of many more states. A larger network of trains meant more distant land could be used for farms, so the United States passed the Homestead Act, giving 160 acres of land to anyone who would cultivate it, bringing more to the distant farming industry. The latter part of this era was known as the Gilded Age of Politics, and much like a gilded object, it had a beautiful exterior, but was ugly and corrupt just under the surface. The political landscape was categorized by political machines and corrupt politicians serving the needs of corporations. In an attempt to remedy this corruption, states instituted railroad regulations, and the government passed the Interstate Commerce Act, which left the ICC to oversee railroad companies, though it was largely ineffective. This time also saw the Pendleton Service Act, which promoted examinations for potential officeholders to determine their ability to be a politician. This was soon reversed in the interest of corporations and the spoil system. Many of these reforms were ushered in by the People's Party, a wing of the populist movement. As a moderate form of socialism, populist ideas grew due to increasing resentment of banks and the elite. Led by Eugene Debs, the populists backed William Jennings Bryan in the election of 1894, but just barely lost, causing many to discontinue their support of the party. American production and the loss of the frontier created a need for expansion, which led to the acquisition of Alaska, brokered by Booker T. Washington, and Hawaii, an important stop between us and Asia. McKinley's new open-door policy expanded our trade relations with Asia, much to the dismay of European powers, until our aid in the Boxer Rebellion gave them more respect for us. Political intervention in Latin America also created new markets for our goods. As America became the world leader in imports and exports, tariffs again became a hot topic of debate. The McKinley Tariff, passed in 1890, increased duties on imported goods, and, along with a few other tariffs, led to resentment of the U.S. by trading nations. This resentment led to the Spanish-American War, started by supposed sabotage of the warship Maine. The following war led to the eradication of Spanish control in Cuba, Puerto Rico, Guam, and the Philippines, as decided in the Treaty of Paris. Even though the war was over, U.S. troops remained in Cuba until they signed the Platt Amendment, giving the U.S. complete control over Cuba's foreign affairs. The U.S. remained involved in most of Cuba's affairs until 1946. The next era in American history is known as the Progressive Era. Progressives held many of the same ideals as populists, but attracted people who were able to be more active in the movement. Progressivism gained attraction in America largely due to muckrakers, journalists who revealed the widespread corruption in business. The most notable of the muckrakers was Upton Sinclair, who wrote The Jungle, exposing the meatpacking industry's horrid conditions. Progressives were met with initial support by Wisconsin Governor Robert La Follette, who passed many progressive acts, such as higher taxes for the rich and the ability for anyone to introduce a law. Though officially a Republican, Theodore Roosevelt became the first progressive president. His anti-business reforms and regulations earned him the nickname of the Trust Buster. William Howard Taft and Woodrow Wilson would be the final two progressive presidents. Wilson defeated TR's second presidential run on the Bull Moose ticket of 1912 and went on to form the Clayton Antitrust Act, the FTC, and the Federal Reserve, all in a very successful attempt to crush monopolies. The Progressive Era contained many other reform movements as well. W.E.B. Du Bois founded the NAACP, fighting for racial equality, while Margaret Sanger spearheaded the more successful women's rights movement, which led to the creation of the 19th Amendment, giving women the right to vote. This era saw the construction of the Panama Canal, a project aspired by T.R., but initially too expensive to complete. By supporting a Panamanian revolution, however, he was able to get a much better deal from the new government. This military intervention became known as the Roosevelt Corollary to the Monroe Doctrine, also known as the Big Stick Policy. The latter part of this era saw World War I, starting with the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand of Austria. The U.S. initially declared neutrality, but it was difficult for us to stay out of the war. German U-boats sank our passenger ship, the Lusitania, killing 1,200 people. TR gave Germany its last warning, but did nothing when they eventually sank another ship. The final straw came with the Zimmermann Telegram, an intercepted message describing a plot by Germany to fund a war with the United States. Even though staying out of World War I was one of his main campaign promises, Teddy Roosevelt entered it. World War I established the precedent for the government to assume more power during a time of war. The War Industry Board oversaw all industrial production. The Espionage and Sedition Acts prevented mail to be harmful to the war effort, violating the First Amendment. The FBI was created to suppress radical groups, and did so in the Palmer Raids, with the government raiding unions and schools to arrest 4,000 suspected radicals. 
The Committee on Public Information was also created during this time, which oversaw pro-war propaganda and the changing of the name sauerkraut to liberty cabbage. As always, World War I came with many social changes. Many women went to work in factories to supply the war effort, while many blacks were enlisted in the army, though they were segregated from the white troops. Wilson's goals for the war were outlined in his 14 points, one of which formed the League of Nations. When the U.S. spelled victory for the Allies, the Treaty of Versailles was drafted to end the war. The treaty punished Germany too harshly, though, and set the sentiment that led to World War II. The economic boom caused by World War I led to the Jazz Age, sponsored by the introduction of electric motors. Automobiles gave rise to suburb cities, while movies and radio became nationally popular. New York experienced the Harlem Renaissance, an explosion in black culture. More women were working outside the home than ever before, and began the image of a flapper. These cultural movements had their opposition, however. The Ku Klux Klan's hatred of anything non-Christian and immigrant helped spawn the Emergency Quota Act, which set limits on immigration by national origin. The Scopes Trial was another famous ruling that outlawed the teaching of evolution in schools. Women's opposition to alcohol consumption by men led to prohibition, which outlawed drinking and led to a plethora of smuggling and illegal manufacture of alcohol. The era also came with a very pro-business government, again causing corruption and greed. This can be seen in the Teapot Dome scandal, where a secretary of the interior was bribed to allow oil companies to drill on public land. The economy could only sustain the corporation's greed for so long, however, and in October 1929 the stock market collapsed, plunging the prosperous America into the Great Depression. The surplus manufacturing of the previously booming companies meant that supply far exceeded demand, so nobody needed to work to manufacture goods, but that also meant nobody had money to buy goods. Bank foreclosures and job loss left many people homeless, who formed shanty towns or Hoovervilles with others in the same condition. At the same time, the Dust Bowl was a drought sweeping the Midwest, forcing farmers to abandon their farms. Hoover responded to the Depression by creating public works projects for jobs and the Smoot-Hawley tariff, which actually turned out to worsen the economy. Hoover's failure to fix the Depression led to an easy victory by Franklin D. Roosevelt, who created the New Deal, leading to massive reforms in just his first hundred days in office. In these days, FDR created the Emergency Banking Relief Bill, bringing banks under federal control to keep them from collapsing, along with the FDIC to insure them and the SEC to regulate the stock market. FDR created hundreds of alphabet agencies as well, creating jobs and regulating industry. These included the Agricultural Adjustment Act, National Industry Recovery Act, Farm Credit Act, Public Works Administration, Works Progress Administration, Civilian Conservation Corps, Tennessee Valley Authority, and the National Labor Relations Board. All of this regulation helped pull the United States out of the Great Depression. When the Supreme Court eventually turned over many of FDR's New Deal programs, he created the Judicial Reorganization Bill to pack the courts with people he liked. This bill failed to pass, however, and led to much criticism of FDR for wanting too much power. In fear of another world war, 62 countries signed the Kellogg-Briand Pact in 1928, promising to avoid war as long as possible. Japan was the first to break this pact when it attacked China in 1937, while no other country could help. The U.S. adopted the good neighbor policy, economically supporting neighboring pro-American countries. As tensions in Europe rose, FDR decided to build a large army and weapons manufacturing infrastructure with the first peacetime draft. When World War II finally broke out, FDR decided to run for an unprecedented third and later a fourth term, winning both by a landslide. When Germany invaded France and Poland in 1940, the U.S. did everything they could to help without entering the war by passing the Lend-Lease Act, lending weapons to Allied powers who could no longer afford any. As Nazi powers were expanding, FDR was looking for an excuse to enter the war, which came in the form of Pearl Harbor, a Japanese attack on Hawaii on December 7, 1941. The U.S. provided a much-needed supply of troops for the Allies, and generally turned the tides of the war, holding off Nazis on all fronts. The first major offensive, planned at the Tehran Conference, was the invasion of Normandy on D-Day. Cut off from supplies and tiring out, Hitler eventually committed suicide and Germany surrendered. The Allies held the Yalta Conference, where they decided how to redistribute land after the war. They decided to create a buffer zone around communist regions. The zone around the Soviet Union would become known as the Iron Curtain, isolating them from the rest of Europe. The Potsdam Conference was held later, attended by Harry Truman, as FDR was now deceased. They formed the United Nations, but the conference started to show differences between the U.S. and the Soviet Union that led to the Cold War. Japan was still a major threat to the Allies, however, but quickly surrendered when hit with two atomic bombs. The war changed things radically at home as well. Huge weapons production forced Americans to ration goods. Technology endeavors such as the Manhattan Project developed radar and the atomic bomb. The Labor Disputes Act allowed the government to seize any business it wanted to in order to help the war effort. Hollywood was encouraged to make pro-war propaganda films. This all allowed the size of the government to triple during the war. Again, African Americans were recruited during the war, but were in segregated troops. Rosie the Riveter was a representation of women's work in the war. The United States put 110,000 Japanese in concentration camps, a very controversial decision. At this point, I'm running out of time, and the rest of what we learned is probably fresh in your mind. In short, the U.S. and the Soviet Union fought a game of chicken known as the Cold War, racing to build nukes and rockets. It made everyone paranoid about communism, so we invaded Vietnam in an attempt to contain communist expansion, but the war was highly controversial, as we didn't do very well. You should be fully reviewed for the AP test now, but if you want a quick summary, stick around. The U.S. was discovered by Columbus, who told Spain, who had joint stock companies from the first colonies until England began most of the expansion in the colonies, but treated us unfairly after creating 13 states, so we rebelled and gained our independence in the Revolutionary War, at which point we made the Articles of Confederation to govern us, but that didn't really work, so we made the Constitution. The next 50 years were spent expanding west, where we clashed with the Indians many times. Slavery became a big thing, the South seceded, the North went to war and defeated the South, outlawing slavery, but starting segregation and a bunch of discrimination. The U.S. expanded some more and formed corporations and big businesses and government, which made us a world power, so we killed everyone in World War I. The Great Depression caused some problems, but we killed everyone again in World War II. The Cold War started, we lost the Vietnam War, 9 11 happened, Michael Jackson. 
tonight and now you're listening to this. But seriously, if you've listened for this long, then I love you. And good luck on the test.